Coming up, he has over 80 film credits. We visit with Hollywood actor Zon McLaren. Plus, the United Nations steps into actions that may violate tribal sovereignty. I am Aliyah Chavez. Join us for those interviews plus headlines from the ICT newscast. The Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication at Arizona State University is honored to be a supporter of Indian Country Today. ASU offers the only online undergraduate digital media literacy degree, teaching students how to recognize and combat inaccuracies on all platforms. They are using cutting edge tools and tactics to separate fact from fiction in a digital world overloaded with misinformation. Learn more at cronkite.asu.edu. This is the ICT Newscast with Aliyah Chavez. Amirawa Hopa. Thank you for joining the ICT Newscast. A new hire at the National Park Service is aiming to enhance repatriation efforts around the country. Last week, David Barland Lyles was hired as a civil penalties investigator. His job will be to explore allegations of museums who have failed to comply with the hallmark law, the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, also known as NAGPRA. NAGPRA requires museums and federal agencies to identify native human remains and other objects of cultural significance, then return them to the tribal nations to which they belong. It has been 31 years since the act was created, and there has never been a full-time investigator until now. Barland Lyles is a 33-year National Park Service veteran. In 1990, he was part of a team that resolved the theft of indigenous human remains from Effigy Mounds National Monument. Park Service Director Chuck Sams weighed in on the hiring, saying, Repatriation is a sacred responsibility for many Native Americans. We hope our efforts to streamline the requirements of NAGPRA and invest in additional staff will lead to more instances of proper repatriation and reburial of Indigenous ancestors and cultural items. Assistant Secretary of Indian Affairs Brian Newland says changes to NAGPRA regulations are on the way and are, quote, long overdue. One billion dollars. That's how much Secretary Tom Vilsack is ordering the Department of Agriculture to invest in for climate smart partnerships that tribes are eligible for. The funding opportunity will pilot new revenue streams that include tribal governments and organizations. Partnerships for climate smart commodities finances farming, ranching, or forestry projects that reduce greenhouse gases or isolates carbon. This could have impacts immediately for Indian country's farming industry. According to the Agriculture Department's annual census, the count of farms with the principal native producer is on the rise. Bill Sachs spoke with ICT about how the funding can support tribal ranchers and farmers who are willing to take on new green practices. It's important for uh, folks in Indian country to understand that tribal organizations and governments can apply uh, for a portion of this billion dollar fund uh, that in turn they can use to basically support uh, Indian farmers uh, who adopt climate smart practices, uh, allowing them to have uh, no financial risk in doing so. The USDA is now accepting project applications for fiscal year 2022. Well, indigenous leaders in the U.S. territory say they are counting on funds from the president's infrastructure law to help improve systems and life for their people. Leaders from American Samoa, Guam, and the Northern Mariana Islands and the U.S. Virgin Islands met with the Interior Secretary Deb Holland last Tuesday. Members of Congress and other federal officials also attended. It marked the first meeting of the interagency group on insular areas since 2020 due to the pandemic. Many areas were identified for improvements. An American Samoa leader say the infrastructure funds will create good-paying union jobs for the next generation. They expect to receive nearly $24 million in the next five years to rebuild roads and bridges. 
In Guam and the Northern Mariana Islands, leaders want to improve roads and also make bicycle and pedestrian paths safer. Each territory also wants to use the funds to improve broadband access, including protection against cyber attacks and making airports safer. A young First Nation snowboarder is getting the chance to compete in the Winter Olympics. 18-year-old Liam Gill will represent Team Canada. Another snowboarder, Derek Livingston, was injured, giving Gill his opportunity to compete. He told Olympics.com, quote, I had totally given up on any hope of going and hadn't even packed my stuff. Now he's on his way. He will participate in the half-pipe competition that runs from February 9th to the 11th. Gill grew up in Calgary and is a member of the Lidley Quay First Nation. His grandmother, Rosemary, says she couldn't believe that he was heading to the Olympics. Gill is the only Indigenous member of the Canadian snowboarding team and says he is proud of his background and hopes to inspire a younger generation of snowboarders. And those are the headlines for the ICT Newscast. Coming up, he starred in dozens of TV shows and movies. Actor Zon McLaren joins us. Stay with us. Zahn McLaren is an award-winning actor who has appeared in over 80 film and television productions. He most recently stole the hearts of many for his role in Reservation Dogs, which has been renewed by Hulu and FX. McLaren was featured in the Disney Plus series Hawkeye, and he is also starring in the upcoming film The Last Manhunt with Jason Momoa. Hi, Zahn. Welcome to the ICT Newscast. Hey, how are you? Good. We're so happy that you're here. So your acting career stretches back 30 years. Tell us what first inspired you to become an actor. Uh, you know, I, I think it started off at uh, Omaha uh, Central High School, and um, I took some drama classes and uh, found it to be fun and enjoyable. And, and uh, I ended up doing some theater in uh, Omaha, Nebraska. And I did a couple of local television commercials and I thought I was ready for the big time. So I moved to California to pursue an acting career in my early 20s. And when you were doing that, what was the reaction of your family or like the other Native members of your community? Because I imagine at the time that wasn't something that was, you know, really uh, prominent. You know, the, what it was was uh, dances. Uh, it was right before dances came out. Um, but I knew of a place in Los Angeles called the American Indian Registry of Performing Arts. And they had a group of natives like uh, Josh Drum from uh, Macy, Nebraska, who was in Thunderheart. Steve Revis was a Blackfeet from Browning. Uh, Wes Studi. Uh, we all came together in the early 90s and were part of the American Indian Registry of Performing Arts. So I knew there was kind of a... Uh, a base in Los Angeles for native performers that we could all congregate, go out on auditions. Uh, we could talk shop and, and um, what's, what's the term they use in Hollywood uh, when we, everybody gets together and schmoozes, hey? <laughs> we all <laughs> schmooze together in the early 90s. And is that something that you all still do together? We do. Uh, unfortunately, we've lost uh, Josh uh, and we've lost uh, Steve. Um, Wes is still around. Uh, obviously, I did. Uh, uh, Wes was on Reservation Dogs, and I spent a lot of time in Santa Fe. And you know, I'll, I'll see Wes down there. And um, yeah, so you know, starting off, um, you know, it was kind of a thing where you know, my my mom and my dad obviously supported whatever I wanted to do, and you know, everybody kind of rolled their eyes like, "Oh, you're going to move out to Los Angeles." I had lived in Los Angeles for a couple of years previously, and I went back to Nebraska. But uh, they kind of all rolled their eyes and said, oh, go for it. You know, I always had that kind of support from my family. And go ahead. We support everything you do. You go for your dreams. 
Geez, and looking back now, I mean, as I mentioned before, 80, over 80 film credits and television productions and things like that. I'm really curious, in all the projects that you've done, which has stood out to you most? You know, each one is different. Um, I had uh, different experiences on each one. Um, you know, maybe, you know, what I did uh, Fargo, that kind of stood out. And um, the, the end product was... Um, something I'm, I'm very proud of. It's award-winning show. And um, so th that kind of stood out. I, I really enjoyed playing Hansi Dent, the, uh, the assassin and uh, who had kind of, um, I don't know, people fell in love with the, the character, uh, even though he was a, a murderer and, you know, an assassin, they, people uh, understood where Hansi was from and kind of related to him a little bit and kind of rooted for him. And that was nice. So. They when all I was have different experiences. All of the shows I've been on are different experiences. I love each one of them for um, different reasons. When I was preparing for this interview, I went back and watched some interviews that you've done uh, previously, and I, I saw something that really stuck with me. Um, you said that you're a nice guy who plays these bad characters. For someone who's not an actor, Take us through your creative process and sort of, you know, showing up on set and saying, I have to go into this role of someone who might not come easily to me. What does that look like for you? Being prepared, doing the homework first, um, making sure that I, uh, when I put, put my foot on that set, that I'm completely, have done my homework and, and prepared and memorized my dialogue, um, you know, finding the character sometimes you don't find it right away sometimes you find it on the set but um is doing as much homework as i possibly can and be prepared when i show up to work just like everybody else around me all the crew are prepared and they're they're doing their jobs and um they expect uh you know the actor to be prepared and do their jobs as well um may, may, mainly it's it's um you know i'll write backstories for characters i'll write their whole uh, family history out and where they come from and I'll just uh, you know write it down in black and white so I can look at it um, and then you get into your costume which adds another layer of prepping for that role of preparing for that role the, the costume always adds a different uh, element and you feel more uh, into the character uh, and I also use um, acting coaches as well I always take my um, material to people that I trust and, and, and go over the material with them and uh, write down ideas and, you know, object, uh, 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 you know, the, the different scenes, I, I try to write out the intentions of the scene. And um, it's just a lot of homework, you know, it, it's, it's pretty standard with what most people do. Uh, and sometimes like on res dogs, you know, you, you get a chance to kind of improv and, you base characters on people you might have grown up around. And, you know, I've definitely based the character on Res Dogs big on one of my uncles growing up around one of my uncles. And <laughs> he used to call <laughs> all the time. I don't know if I could use that word on here, but <laughs> he used to call me <laughs> all the time. So that kicked, that popped up in the character and it was an improv and um, it worked out well. So there's many ways to, to approach these characters and, different approaches. Sometimes I'll use different approaches in each character. I'd actually love to talk more about Reservation Dogs. People just really fell in love with you in that show. I'm curious, what has been the response from people in person who are meeting you in person? Because online, you know, people made a meme out of you. Um, and I feel like people tweet and they post on Facebook. They love it. But in person, what has been the reaction? A lot of, uh, you know, like walking down the street and somebody yelled at me. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, can I use this language on here? I apologize. If, uh, <laughs> I hope you guys have to cut it out. But um, yeah, it, you know, people are very positive reaction. People really like the show Reservation Dogs. And I'm just so proud of all the, well, Sterling Harjo and Taika and, and what they've done with it and all the writers and the producers on the show. Um, it's just been positive. You know, I went up to Al and I um, in South Dakota uh, in December and, and, you know, people were just extremely responsive and um, 
laughing you know they it, it's good to laugh obviously and it's it's nice to do a character where uh it makes people laugh yeah i can imagine and i think all around i mean we've had um sterling on the show himself but i'd love to ask you the same question that i asked him what does it mean to work on a project as groundbreaking as Reservation Dogs, especially for you, you know, coming off all of the productions that you've done, but to work on a on a show that has an indigenous cast and crew? Well, it means, I mean, it's everything that we've um, we've been working for, for for multiple years, for 30 years I've been in this business to be a part of a show that's written and directed and, and starring and produced by Native Americans, you know, we're finally getting a, a voice in this business. And, uh, you know, it's been a long time. Uh, we've all been working at it. And we finally got our chances with Reservation Dogs and as well as Rutherford Falls. Um, there's another show coming out called Dark Winds, which uh, is uh, written uh, by Native writers. Uh, it's based on a Tony Hillerman book, but it's a different take from Tony Hillerman written by Native writers. Um, so we, we're all, um, we're all finally getting to a spot in, uh, in this business where, um, we're doing everything crew, you know, a lot of the crew is all native, obviously on Res Dogs and Rutherford Falls and, and Dark Winds. So, um, it's, it's, uh, amazing that we finally have gotten here and that people are taking risks and finally allowing like Sterling and, uh, Sierra Ornelius to, to run uh, television shows that are that are native. They're finally these networks are realizing that you know there is a market out there for these this content. You know, and we've always known that. Sure, we only make up a small percentage of the population in the United States, but you know we, we make up some. I mean, I, what I heard what was when Res Dogs came out that the the numbers on subscriptions on Hulu jumped ten times within you know like. Nebraska and South Dakota and North Dakota and Arizona, where all the Indians live. And, um, you know, I think FX and these networks finally realized, oh, there is a market been for, for Native content. And I am just feel very grateful that I'm a part of that. And I'm at a stage in my career where I'm, where I'm, uh, people want to hire me on these projects. Talking about a stage in your career, I have one last question. What's next for you? Do you have a dream project? Is there something that you really want to work on? You know, I just want to work with good people and and people I want to be around. Um, I've got some, I'm trying my hand at a little bit of producing and uh, I just want to be around good people and, and work with good people and people like Sterling and uh, Taika and all the producers from Res Dogs. And I can't wait to get back and hang out with them. And we, we just have a lot of fun on, on the show. So dream projects, uh, just want to work on good material and, um, and be around good people. Well, Son McLernan, please visit us again. Thank you for being here. Thank you. I appreciate that. United Nations has taken a rare step of intervening in the internal affairs of a U.S. tribe. Last week, two U.N. officials called on the U.S. to prevent the planned evictions of 63 people from federally subsidized homes controlled by the Nooksack tribe in northern Washington. Chris Adland is a reporter for ICT and Underscore News, and he has been following the issue. He joins us now to tell us more. Hi, Chris. Set the stage for us. What's happening up there in Washington? So uh, several years ago, um, more than 300 uh, Nooksack people were, were disenrolled from the tribe, um, and it was kind of a part of a years-long, uh, you know, disputed disenrollment, and uh, um, now uh, the tribal leaders want to um, evict uh, 63 um, people who um, 
are, are part of this, this, this group of 306 people who, who were evicted, or I, I should say uh, disenrolled, and want to uh, evict them from the homes. Many of them have been living in for you know, more than 20 years um, and uh, you know, give, those, give those a tribal member. As the tribe says, um, you know, there's a housing shortage and that they have um, you know, elderly, um, homeless people that, that need you know, these tribally owned uh, homes. Previously disenrolled more than 300 citizens And 63 of those people lived in tribal housing and are now um, at risk of getting evicted. Why were they disenrolled in the first place? So it uh, it stems back to these this this group of 300 people and and these 63 who um, you know are facing eviction now um, are all descended from from one person who, um, uh, when the tribe went back and looked, um, you know, years ago. kind of found that this this one person um, did not fit the criteria, although she was, you know, Indigenous and, and, and um, First Nations Indigenous um, did not fit that tribe's criteria. You know, she was, for example, she wasn't on a, a crucial 1940s tribal census. She hadn't been given an allotment, et cetera. So um, they uh, used that to try and kick these 306 people out. Um, what the 300 and, and kind of their, their advocates will say um, is that, um, you know, it, it, it was essentially a power grab and that this group of 300 had been, you know, over the years, pretty politically powerful and um, kind of a new, um, you know, power dynamic um, wanted to, you know, cement themselves as, as um, you know, being, being the, the, the powerful powerful ones in in tribal affairs and, you know, wanted to, you know, I guess get as as much uh, opposition out of the way as possible. Something that's really striking, as I mentioned in the introduction, is now that the UN is sending two officials to actually investigate these evictions, what are they finding and what are they saying? So, um, you know, the, the concern is, and, and the federal government has has been investigating um, and has recently completed some of that, um, you know, and the concern for the UN is that, you know, these evictions kind of being in the winter, coming amid um, a COVID-19 pandemic, and, um, you know, with many of those facing eviction being elderlies, elderly, I should say, um, uh, ill or have a disability or even have, you know, young children under their care that it would be, you know, inhumane and, and violate kind of international housing human right no- human rights norms. Um, the, 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 those facing eviction and their attorney have also, you know, alleged that, um, you know, they're violating uh, federal civil rights laws and that, um, you know, a lot of these people actually outright own their homes or are in the process of completing completing the ownership process through um, um, lease to own agreements that they signed you know some as far back as 15 years ago um, for these these homes which although they are um, tribal tribally owned and tribal housing um, they are um, federally subsidized through the um, housing and urban development uh, department I imagine an issue like this, an issue of disenrollment, is one that is um, really controversial for a community. For the Nooksack community, I imagine, as you said earlier, there's probably two sides to this. There's people who are enrolled citizens and um, the tribal government, and then there are others who are saying disenrollment is a big problem. What are you finding in your reporting about the grander topic of disenrollment? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's the, that that is the the kind of the, those are the the lines, the the, the two sides, and um, you know it, it's it's rare, you know, the, the the even the U.S. government kind of stepping in and and um, pushing the the tribe to at least pause these evictions while it investigates, and and being so um, vocal about that is is rare, um, and is seeming to be rare, and, and even just kind of I think helps illustrate kind of the issue. Um, you know, the tribe and, and those in favor are saying that this is a something that is an internal affair and, you know, they have the right um, to determine citizenship 
Um, you know, on the other hand, you know, those who have been disenrolled and, and kind of their, their, uh, their side, I mean, they're saying, you know, that, that they belong and they just want the affirmation that this is their community. They've lived there for years, um, you know, and this is their culture and, um, you know, that, uh, they, they wanted to be, they want to be treated and recognized as such, you know, it doesn't have anything to do with, um, you know, any sort of benefits that might come from, from membership, you know, financial or anything like that. It's, it, it boils down to, you know, they've lived in these homes for years and this is their community and they just want to continue to, to, to be in that community. So Chris, what comes next for these Nooksack people? The, the federal government has completed part of its investigation for several of the families facing eviction. Although, um, the, their lawyer has said that the, the government didn't address several issues that they had wanted it to see addressed, mainly whether they own these homes or not. So that's still an open question. The tribe says, you know, it's it's basically got the green light and, um, you know, has even come out and asked for a traction from the UN statement saying it has, has no right to, to be involved in something like this. So um, those facing eviction are expecting it to come now. Well, Chris Adland will continue to watch your reporting. Thank you so much. Thanks. Appreciate it. And that's a slice of our Indigenous world. Thank you for watching. For all the latest news, visit IndianCountryToday.com. Stay safe, my relatives. I am Aaliyah Chavez. Sometimes you got to take a stand Just because you know you can oh, You got to run, you got to run, you got to run.